Thank you, Frank. Uh, tonight on WNCN Live, we have a very exciting performer. He plays an instrument that in the 19th century no one even knew of any longer because it had been supplanted by the modern piano. That, of course, is this gorgeous harpsichord that Kenneth Cooper is sitting at this moment. So, of course, our guest is one of the leading harpsichordists and Baroque specialists in the United States, Kenneth Cooper. How are you? Just fine. Well, you know, we have a wonderful program, and um, would you tell us what it is? Because I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever tell you in the first place? No. <laughs> <laughs> we have four groups. One is the um, Bach Chromatic Fantasia and Fugue, and then a group of Ramo pieces, which don't quite go together. Uh, With the Bach, you mean, or the four <laughs> Rameau? Probably either. Uh -huh. um, a group of um, pieces by Bartok and a group of Scarlatti sonatas. Sounds wonderful. Are you prepared to begin with that white-hot piece of Baroque romanticism, Bach's chromatic fantasy and fugue? And I will bet you will say or agree with me that this is one of the most wonderful keyboard works of the 18th century. No doubt about it. And uh, I've been playing it a lot the last year or two, and uh, it's not a piece that one gets tired of easily. Every time something new comes out of it, and it's almost now an adventure to see what, what new is waiting. You, know? you won't know until you play it. Are you right. aware, Ken, when you are playing it that this is something new that's happening to your performance? It seems to be happening to the piece. Mm -hmm. I seem to be learning something. Uh, but if is this, is this happening working. to you at the moment you're playing it? Are you aware that it may be different? Or? Sure. Uh -huh. Sure. How interesting. Um, if it's too different, mm -hmm. uh, I can get very distracted and I can forget <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> And, and what do you mean too different? Do you mean that you're in the mood for something so expansive that, that it's out of control in a certain way? Well, for example, the other day I was playing a Mozart um, keyboard sonata on the forte piano, and um, I had conjured up in my mind this sort of operatic scene for it in which I thought this happened and then that happened and so forth. And uh, I arrived at the trio section of the minuet, which I thought was a nice little trio section in the minuet. And I discovered as I was playing it that this is really the center point of this entire sonata. Oh, this is what has been leading up to and what is going to be led away from. Mm. And so um, as I was thinking that, I thought, oh, how beautiful this is. And I forgot where I was. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did, did the wrong thing somehow. I don't know. Well, now I forget you, what happened. Just Ken, thinking. if you do that now, we certainly forgive you, and you can then, of course, begin again. <laughs> so, oh, well, uh, however you do it, we will be happy to hear it. Our guest tonight on WNCN Live, Kenneth Cooper, and we hear that great work, The Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue by J.S. Bach.
Fantasy and Fugue, Bach, performer on the harpsichord, Kenneth Cooper, our guest tonight on WNCN Live. Kenneth, you really were carried away, of course, in that, and no mishaps. Now. Thank you. <laughs> Rameau is considered in the history books one of the great composers that ever lived, and yet he seems to be more of the history books an actual performance, and he was born just about the same time Bach was. How come this is so? Or am I wrong? I don't know who's right about this. Um, to be perfectly honest, this is Remo's 300th or something birthday. Yeah. And so, therefore, somebody asked me to play Remo this year. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. wonderful when... when sentiment gets the better of us, you know. But, um, and I, you know, I have always played these pieces, but I've never played them in public, and I've, I've always liked them, um, but I never felt that they were easy to project on a stage. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went poking through the Remo keyboard works, and I decided I was fed up with them. Um, and that although some of them had charm and sort of lasted through one sight reading or two or three, that I didn't really feel like sitting down and working on them. And then I discovered um, a new edition that had come out, um, which cost 70 bucks, by the way, but that's another matter. Um, well, Rameau deserves it. He is 300 years old. And <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> that, that's a matter of some controversy. It's, it's no longer under copyright, you know. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but um, these are recently published transcriptions by Rameau of pieces from his opera, his opera ballet called Les Andes Galantes. Yes. Um, and I'd never heard of them, but I suppose that's just because I missed them somewhere in some library, and I was delighted to come across them. Of the 30 or so pieces, I liked about five of them. Um, and so I've picked one, two, three, four, five pieces from this group. Uh, and I've stuck in one of my old favorites from the regular keyboard pieces uh, called La Poule de Hen, which you probably know. It's probably his most popular piece. Um, the, I've done some ornamentation and some uh, fooling around with the transcriptions. Uh, but I should tell you what the pieces are so that you will get the full humor out of them. Les Andes Galantes, uh, I think properly translated, and means the Indies, by which Rameau referred to, I think, anything that wasn't France. <laughs> uh, uh, and this particular opera, uh, ballet, it's mostly dancing, actually, dancing, singing, choral, um, and orchestral pieces. Uh, has, has different scenes about uh, what take place in the, in the East Indies and in the, in the Middle East, uh, which was, of course, in those days, uh, Persia or Turkey. Um, and there are scenes that take place, one's in North America and one is actually takes place in Inca, Peru. Um, I don't know how much Remo understood about any of these places, except that this was in 1735, rather exotic stuff, and the newspaper reports were beginning to come in about how exciting these places and how bizarre some of these places were. And the point of view, I think, that this work takes is that um, uh, we, are, we French, that is, uh, are in a position to enlighten all these savages. Mm -hmm. um, and so the word galant, I think, means um, brought up to date. Uh, so les Angalantes, here we are, we can bring the Turks up to date and we can bring the, the Incas up to date just by our uh, modern, new modern theories of democracy and I mean, this is the 1730s, you know, the era of the, of the Enlightenment. So. The age of reason. The age of reason. And so the scene about the Turks, for example, uh, is the same story as the Seraglio of Mozart, for example, in which the, uh, the Pasha catches the two lovers and has them in his power, but frees them instead of killing them because he's enlightened and he understands and so forth. So I've picked, well, let's put this into three groups. The first two pieces belong together. They're from the Inca scene. And one of them is called Air Grave pour les Incas du Peru. Uh, and it's the air of the Incas for the, uh, to, for the um, sun worshiping. Okay. Um, 
And the second piece is part of the same scene. It's a sort of gavat. It's a particular, particularly formal little gavat um, because the scene is just about to be interrupted by an earthquake, which uh, I'm not going to attempt to do on the harpsichord, <laughs> uh, but um, in which you will hear this nice little elegant and sort of actually sad little gavat interrupted by rumblings of what is going to be in the next piece, the piece you will not hear. Uh, <laughs> uh, a very ferocious and very incredibly orchestrated earthquake. Okay, after those two pieces I will put in La Poule, which is a description of the hen. And then the final three pieces come from the scene about the Turks, uh, and they are called uh, Air pour les amants et les amantes, the lovers of war and the lovers of peace, uh, to put it briefly. And uh, there's a very aggressive part and a very lyrical part. And you will be able to tell, I think, which is which, uh, because the, uh, the warlike people win out, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and um, then follows into the next piece, Air pour les Bostangis. And those of you who come from 18th century Turkey will know uh, <laughs> that Bostangis are the Turkish military. And so they make a lot of noise and they they look very fierce, and uh, well, what they do, I think, is a matter of history. Um, and then finally, the tambourin, um, which is the re general rejoicing because the, the uh, uh, Pasha has decided to release two of his slaves, the two lovers, and uh, everybody lives happily ever after. Right. Or something like that. Well, you're going to now celebrate for us the 300th probable birthday of Ramo. <laughs>
Keyboard music by Ramo on his 300th birthday, played by our guest tonight on WNCN Live, Kenneth Cooper. After a word from Citibank, more WNCN Live. Well, we are back, and um, we invite you at WNCN to come to WNCN Live, which is every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Next week, we have, as guests, New York Vocal Arts Ensemble. That's November 29th. Kenneth Cooper is here tonight, and he tells me that in two days, he will be flying to Detroit to try to resurrect the memory of that poor fellow, Salieri. <laughs> <laughs> only you would do this, because you would be the only man in the world, probably, to easily find the music. Well, <laughs> tell us about this performance of a concerto uh, in C major with the Detroit Symphony that you're doing. Salieri uh, didn't do too badly. He was a uh, very well-known in his time, very famous man. And what we are discovering is that he was not a, a bad composer. And I think that uh, anyone who has, who was party to the latest Broadway arguments. Uh, as to him versus Mozart, had better discard most of that as nearly all fiction. Uh, Mozart seemed to get along very well with Salieri, and they were both respectable and cordial gentlemen and so on. Yes. Um, this concerto by Salieri, which apparently I did the first American performance of a year or two ago with Newell Jenkins and the Clarion Orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, I will do next week, or this week rather, at the, with the Detroit Symphony. Um, it is um, one of his two known keyboard concertos. Um, it is very, it is, you know, Mozartian in some of the outward aspects, um, but it is very much more Italian and yeah. witty and disruptive. Um, and can, much can you less play the first theme? Can you play the first theme for us? Yeah, it goes something like. Right, I'm glad WNCN has heard this before Detroit. That's all I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Is now, that what that was about? That well, was you see how this <laughs> this music comes to a complete halt about a bar and a half after it has started. Yeah. Uh, it's quite a deliberate <laughs> effect. I hope uh, well, won't not be taken as too serious. <laughs> notwithstanding uh, Amadeus, the play um, Beethoven himself studied with Haydn, and he didn't like him much at all but he sure did like to study with Salieri. So uh, this man has had more, more misjustices do him throughout the 19th century. There was a, a, an opera by Rimsky-Korsakov uh, discussing this same uh, idea, and this poor, poor man is finally being uh, placed where he should be as an admirable composer of the 18th century. The, uh, the, the real disservice I think we've done him is that we don't know his music at all. Mm -hmm. He has a, a, a half a dozen instrumental pieces, but his, the bulk of his output is opera and these beautiful vocal chamber works, duets and trios and quartets for voices of different kinds. I've seen you know a half a dozen of them, but uh, there are hundreds of them there, and th that would be the service to Salieri. Yes. Then we would find out at least whether this is worth remembering yes. or not. Yes, there's, there's so much music to... Uh discover, we sometimes are, are um, so involved in just, you know, a specific amount of music. For instance, we have always heard our next group, uh, Bartok's five pieces here, from a group uh, called the Child's World, Microcosmos, and uh, they were written for piano. And how did you come to play these by uh, a modern composer on the harpsichord? Well, it also comes from not believing everything you read in the paper. Um, in one of the volumes of the microcosmos in the front, in the forward, right at the bottom, in very small print, probably in Hungarian, <laughs> uh, although if that was so, I wouldn't have understood it, but it says, these, some of these pieces may also be played on the harpsichord. And I think Bartok named a couple of all the wrong pieces. <laughs> um, because he was thinking of the, you know, the imitation Bach pieces and the imitation counterpoint pieces as sort of being appropriate to this antique instrument. I think if he had any idea what a beautiful harpsichord sounded like or could sound like, 
uh, he might have utilized it, let's say, something the way he began to expand the sounds of the string quartet or the orchestra or the various other mediums, violin especially. Yes. Uh, and so I've deliberately taken um, some of his more modernistic sounding pieces and um, fitted them to a somewhat modernistic manner of playing the harpsichord. Um, the five pieces are, the first one is not from the microcosmos, it's from the 10 easy pieces of 1905 or 6 or 7 or something. Mm -hmm. Eight. Uh, eight, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, it's called Evening in Transylvania, and um, it's not what you think it means. Uh, um, Transylvania is a beautiful country with rolling hillsides in northern Romania, southern Hungary, northern Romania. I remember the pastries there with special pleasure. Um, and this, uh, Bartok even describes this uh, uh, vocally on a record somewhere as being a contrast between the kind of a peasant flute in the distance and a dance. So it's a song and a dance and a song and a dance. And you'll be able to tell, I hope, which is which. Um, the other four are from the microcosmos, and they are staccato, harmonics, um, which needs just a word of explanation. The, the piano version of harmonics uh, doesn't work at all on the harpsichord, so I've devised a whole different way of playing the piece, which doesn't involve harmonics at all. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't change the name of the piece. Um, the th fourth piece is called From the Diary of a Fly. Hmm. Um, and you may imagine what goes on. I think uh, this was one, one piece that Bartok used as an example of why the microcosmos should have come out with illustrations. Uh, it never did for some reason, but he suggested that this would have been a good, a good uh, item for that. And finally, the ostinato from
Kenneth Cooper playing Bartok on the harpsichord, five pieces. Someone said Cooper and his harpsichord are definitely not stuck in an 18th century rut, and that's another example of his adventurous programming. Well, we're going to now hear four sonatas on WNCN Live played by Kenneth Cooper by perhaps the greatest harpsichord virtuoso that ever lived. I would say. Yeah. Well, tell us about these uh, sonatas by Scarlatti in one minute. In one minute? <laughs> You're trying to cramp my style? No. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I just want to make sure we get every sonata in. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scarlatti spent most of his life in Spain uh, teaching the uh, princess how to play the harpsichord, among other things. And, um, um, and um, his sonatas, uh, with over 500 of them, uh, many of them have taken on quite a flamenco uh, coloring, rhythm, dance rhythm, uh, harmonic flair. Um, I went to see a flamenco dance troupe last summer, and I discovered really how angry some of this rhythm is really meant to be. I don't dare give it on the harpsichord the way they did, gave it with their shoes on the floor. Um, but uh, it definitely has a, a tremendous um, uh, passion behind the rhythmic vitality. And so I've picked four pieces with uh, something like uh, a flamenco or a Spanish dance-like attitude or color. Uh, and they are the E major K380, uh, which you will probably know. The D major K number 424, the C major K number one, something or other, um, and the F sharp major K number 319. I just want to say that's not Kershaw, but uh, Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick catalog. Yeah. Well, let's hear them. I can't wait.
Kenneth Cooper has just played for Scarlatti Sonatas for us. There will be more WNCN Live after this message from Citibank. We've had a wonderful time with much harpsichord uh, galore. Uh, one more piece. Do you have an encore for us? This is a Scotch tune arranged by Purcell with a little help called Peggy, I Must Leave Thee. Okay. Just enough time to say goodnight to you, and I want to ask you, what kind of harpsichord is that? This is a copy of a Tascan, French 18th century harpsichord. It was a Hubbard design, and it was built by Ed Brewer about 1960-something, seven or eight. Hmm. And are these instruments, because I'd love to own one, are they fantastically expensive, like of pianos? Of course. Uh-huh. <laughs> I guess I won't own one. It's possible. Ken, thanks so much for being here. I want to tell everyone that you have made many recordings uh, with um, the flutist uh, Robison, right? Paula Robison. Yes, and, but you have made a recent one on CBS with uh, Yo-Yo Ma. Yes, three box and uh, solo works by Handel and Scarlatti for Vanguard, and on and on. You've had a wonderful time in your career, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank I want you. to thank the audience for being here. And this is David Dubal. Thank you for listening.